We are at Central Wyoming College in Riverton, Wyoming at the 7th Annual Leadership Symposium. Right now, the um, last two days of the symposium is the special education law. We pick our special education attorneys very carefully, and then they come and they bring their national perspective with them along with circuit court decisions. So they're very savvy to 10th Circuit Court, which is what Wyoming is under, and our Chapter 7 rules. Um, it's very important that they know what's happening here and um, they present to that, to that audience. We're going to start off with a series of introductions and then each attorney is going to be put on the hot seat for an explanation of what they think or a description of what they think would be the top 10 special education pitfalls, quagmires, and speed bumps. But they have to. They can't just talk about what's not working. They have to give a helpful avoidance tip as well. So we're going to start off with Celine on the end. I'm going to welcome her. This is her first year on the panel, so please give a big welcome to Celine Almason. Good morning. I'm Celine Almazan. I have been an attorney since 1986. I represent families in least restrictive environment matters. I am co-executive director of a nonprofit agency in Maryland. Um, where I represent families who are looking to um, have their children with disabilities attend their neighborhood schools, return to their neighborhood schools, access general education um, classrooms. Before that, I was a legal aid lawyer um, where I represented uh, children who were abused and neglected and, of course, had um, a myriad of special education um, issues. Um, I fell into um, special education when I was in law school in a clinic during uh, institutionalization in Washington, D.C., and have um, had a passion for it ever since. As it turns out, I ended up having a child um, that needed IEP services, as well as a child who had a 504 plan. Both children ended up getting um, services while they were in post-secondary. Um, I enjoy what I do. About 60% of my families that I represent um, are low income or live in poverty. Um, so thank you. I'm happy to be here. Hey, good morning. My name is Jose Martin. I'm a special education attorney from Austin, Texas. I've been in practice since 1990, and this has been my exclusive area of practice since I began. I represent school districts in Texas. I do consult and speak nationally. And uh, we've devoted our practice, our firm, which is my law partner is, is Dave Richards, exclusively devotes its, its time to issues relating to students with disabilities in the public school. And it's been a very nice area of practice to work with educators for our career. Julie? Hi, I'm Julie Weatherly, and I'm from LA, Lower Alabama. Um, my law practice is in Mobile. I have a law partner in Birmingham, Alabama. She covers the north, I cover the south. And uh, as Jose's firm does, we specialize strictly in representation of schools in the area of special education. And I personally have been doing this for 28 years now and have enjoyed every second of it. Hi, I'm Dave Richards. I'm a Jose Martinez law partner from Texas. Um, like Jose, I work with school districts in Texas in terms of legal matters and then consult across the country. I also have the joy of uh, working a lot in Section 504 and do a lot of speaking and consulting in that as well. I found in my practice that a lot of lawyers aren't comfortable with the kinds of clients they work with. And I found that in the school business, I know that I'm going to be working with people that generally love kids and like to be around them. They're nice clients. They're nice people. And that's a, it's, it's a nice thing. It's good to represent folks that are trying to do what's right. Well, good morning. I'm Kathy Mayford with the law firm of Reed Smith, and I'm from Richmond, Virginia. I have been doing special education law since 1978, and uh, that is my sole practice, is special education law, representing school districts. And I represent probably about 90 of the school of the 130 school districts in Virginia, and also lecture nationally on special education law. And obviously, I have a great deal of passion for this area of the law. It's good to be here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to, to see everyone again. Uh, my name is Tom Shorter. I am an attorney uh, in the Madison, Wisconsin office of Godfrey and Kahn. 
Uh, Madison, uh, if you haven't been there, it's the home of the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. We take great <laughs> pride in our Wienermobile. Um, I, I spend my time representing school districts, although I have a little bit of a blend practice. I also do a lot of health care uh, work and actually have found a lot of interesting intersection between those areas of law over the years. Um, and, and much like, like Dave said, I, I just I think it's wonderful working with schools. I, I really enjoy the people. It's, it's the, really the fun part of doing this kind of practice. So it's a pleasure to be here. I, I've, I've been, I think, to every one of the leadership symposiums since it started, and it's really great to see a lot of the same faces again. So good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Amy Getz from St. Paul, Minnesota and I represent uh, students and their families in uh, primarily special education disputes, but also uh, other kinds of school law matters. And uh, my background is in legal services and I did a stint at the Disability Law Center in Minnesota and uh, also at the Department of Education in Minnesota where I met Lenore um, and have been doing this work in school law since about 1995. Um, and really appreciate the opportunity to be back again with you this year. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're going to jump into our stopwatch period. It's kind of like speed dating, only they're going to go from topic to topic to topic. When I tell them to stop, they have to stop, and we have to move on. OK? So we're, we have a volunteer, if you can believe that. Amy has volunteered to go first, just to give you the order so you can help me remember. We're going to go Amy, Jose, Julie, Dave, Tom, Kathy, and Celine. All right? Ready, Amy? Ready. All right, your five minutes to talk about the top 10 special education pitfalls, quagmires, speed bumps, with helpful avoidance tips starts now. OK, so I, I commented before we started, there are so many. It's hard to choose. Jokingly. Tough job. <laughs> um, but probably one that plagues families and school districts a lot, I think, is the sense that, the, that there are rules in schools and they can't be modified. And we face that dilemma a lot in uh, the, the cases that come into our office. Where, and especially, I think, it happens in questions of discipline, um, sometimes in questions of curriculum and, and class choices and um, extracurricular activities. But the, the common theme seems to be the rules are the rules and they apply to everybody and it just wouldn't be fair if we modified the rules for your child. What would we tell everybody else? Um, and uh, of course, uh, from, from, from the, the perspective of the laws that protect kids with disabilities, uh, that's um, not the right answer. Maybe we can get to that answer, uh, the answer being we're not going to modify this particular rule because we have discussed it, we have uh, determined that there are good and sound reasons consistent with the competing interests you know, that, that come to bear when we discuss these types of issues, especially I think as they implicate safety concerns in schools and discipline issues, for instance, we might get to that conclusion, but it's almost never the right answer unless the question is, uh, I want to modify the, the disciplinary rule for my child so that he can bring his gun to school. Um, and that's never a question I've had come into my office yet. <laughs> Um, and so uh, the avoidance tips, I think, for, for dealing with that kind of um, approach is, number one, never say this. Number two, take it back if you do. <laughs> number three, recognize that rules and policies are subject to modification, with very few exceptions. And the exceptions that I'm putting in the, uh, that the pile of we're not going to modify uh, these policies um, always involve the kind of um, serious offenses that lead to the recognition in the federal law um, and, and the IDEA that schools, they're so serious that, that it overcomes the right of the team to decide about changes of placement. 
and so it gives schools unilateral authority to change a placement because we have such a serious circumstance, and that is drugs and weapons and serious bodily injury. Um, I think that knowing that what is fair doesn't always mean what is equal, that everybody doesn't need to be treated the same in order for equity to prevail. And I think that a lot of administrators get that and some don't. And it's usually administrator pushback, frankly, when, when we're getting this message about modifying rules in their application of a particular child. It, it has become clear to me, and it's taken me, I'm embarrassed to say, 20-some years of this practice to really recognize that Section 504 and the ADA have become subsumed by uh, the IDEA. That is, when special education came on board, we suddenly lost our sights on 504 and ADA, and in the educational context, in my view, it has drifted into atrophy, and we need to, to breathe life back into 504 and ADA for a variety of reasons. It's a non-discrimination law. It takes us to a far better standard of comparison in terms of what children with disabilities get relative to their non-disabled peers than what I call bumping along the bottom of the river with Rowley. Um, and, and so, Pulling back this curtain, we've created this artificial kind of glass curtain, as I conceive of it, between IDEA, that silo over here that we operate in, and then we can see through to that other side. We can see that 504 is over there and ADA is over there, and we know that it applies in most instances to the child who's getting special education, but we have this very tunnel vision in terms of how it is where we talk about uh, these protections and the courts have not helped us in Time's my up. opinion Okay, <laughs> said it's speed dating times up All right one more tip. Alternatives. Is that not a lawyer wait wait one more okay, okay. Alternatives to suspension because if we're talking about discipline policies Proactive work on what else can we do is always good. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Anybody want to react to that very briefly before we move on? Go ahead, I, Kathy. I have to react to the bumping along the bottom of the river. <laughs> that is not the rally standard. The rally standard is appropriate, not lowered appropriate. It's appropriate, not best. Okay. Anybody else? Burning? All right. If not, we are going to move on to Jose and your five minutes. Oh. I should, I'm sorry, got to qualify. One of the challenges that I gave them is that they can't repeat anything, any subject or tip that their colleagues have given. So we're going for depth here. You're going to hear new information each time. So the further down the line, you see we had to pick numbers because the further down the line you get, the more difficult it is to have a unique topic. Um, so Jose is next. He chose my number exactly, and he's got five minutes starting now. Right. Actually, the last person has the challenge, right? You have to be really innovative. That's me. Yeah. Somebody's going to take you your idea. Right? I did, but I'm the last one. I'm the first. I'm the newbie, so I get a pass. The the area of, of pitfall that I want to focus on is is actually part of the presentation that I'm going to do on child find in relation to RTI, and I think that what we had was a system where. Child find, and that's obviously the coordinated set of activities that we undertake in public education to find students that may have disabilities that should be evaluated because we suspect that they have disabilities, has been rendered more complex by the emergence of RTI innovations, by the emergence of a broader universe of interventions that are available in regular education. 20 years ago, we had two speeds. We had regular ed and we had special ed. How do we know if a child might need an evaluation for special ed? He's not working out in the first year in regular ed, so must be a special ed student. Now, that's much more complex. There's a lot of interventions that are available in regular education. Moreover, as of 2004, IDEA recognized that it's a valid analysis 
to provide a child high-quality research-based interventions and assess the child's responses to that intervention in making decisions about whether the child is a child with a learning disability or not. So as these intervention systems have emerged, the questions have become more complicated. When do we refer a child who is having academic problems? Do we refer a child who's having academic problems after interventions have been attempted? And if so, how long does the child have to struggle through the intervention process before we decide there's a suspicion? of a learning disability and the child should be referred. If we guess wrong and the child has languished too long in interventions and the child winds up qualifying as learning disabled, are you now liable for compensatory services for the period of time that the interventions weren't working out successfully or a, a portion of that time? Oh, the issue of when we suspect a learning disability has become more complex, it's more fraught. How do we deal with parent requests for evaluations? If the child hasn't received interventions, is the appropriate answer to tell the parent, well, our policy is to attempt a certain amount of interventions first, and then we gather data, assess how the child has responded, and then proceed to an evaluation? Um, how do we deal with parent requests for referral in the middle of an RTI intervention process. Perhaps if it looks like there's some promise to the interventions and the child's making some progress, can the parent essentially scuttle the RTI intervention process by asking for a special ed evaluation? Um, at what point is the district exposed to an award of compensatory services? And there's a lot of cases in this area. A lot of cases where the parent is contesting the child find point. My child should have been evaluated at an earlier time. They were doing interventions. The interventions wound up not working out. And now my child is LD, but he missed X amount of months or weeks of free appropriate public education and special education services. Should I not get those months back in the form of compensatory services? So is the answer that schools should offer the special ed evaluation up front when the child is immediately struggling and starting the intervention process? And I actually think that the way to work this out and the, the practical advice is to really view part, parents as partners in the intervention process and have an explanation to the parent about the full spectrum of interventions that are available in the school, anything from the smallest tutoring program through RTI interventions all the way to referral to special education. And all of that should be explained and put on the table. Nothing should be hidden. Nothing should be under the table. And the parent should be told, we have interventions available that may hold promise. We can go ahead and move towards an evaluation at this time. We can even do both. We can move towards an evaluation, and during the evaluation time period, we can try some interventions. But I think the best approaches are those where we're not telling the parent what's going to happen, but we rather involve the parent in partnership in the intervention and child find process. And I think there, you can achieve the balance that you want. And that's my that time. was and not me, by the way, but his five minutes are up. That was perfect timing. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jose. Anybody have a burning response? That I, I time myself. Oh, very good. I thought his wife was calling or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any burning response to that? Anyone? Only one comment to, uh, for me, which is to say, Jose is such a pro. He just did an advertisement for our joint session. Will be coming up. Well done, Jose. Well done. I, I will say that when RTI sort of started sweeping the nation in popularity, I recall getting a lot of comments from people that I might be training or working with, saying that. You know, we've been told at the school we can now no longer refer the student until the child has been in this new process for so many months or what have you. And I was very concerned from a legal perspective about that. I think, hello? <laughs> oh darn. That, that's the noise you're making. <laughs> I'm making noise. Pacemaker? Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> Not yet. Anyway. Not yet. 
<laughs> in terms of, you know, we've been told we have to do this for this long, and I worried as a lawyer about the RTI initiative butting heads with the affirmative child find duty, which I think is what Jose was saying, and I'm still seeing that today uh, across the country with the, we can't refer until we've gone this long in this process, and a lot of parents feel their children are languishing in that process. So. Thanks, Julie. Amy, you want to say something? Just a quick comment. I, I really want to thank Jose for the focus on parent involvement in the decision and the process of RTI. I think the more often that parents, that the processes are transparent, that parents are really involved in the decision, uh, we, we avoid so much in terms of problems at the back end. Okay, thank you. You ready to go, Julie? All right, your five minutes starts now. Well, this was very difficult, and when I got the email saying, we're not going to assign you anything, in fact, you're going to be competing, <laughs> as soon as we got up here, I got up here early just so I could look at notes and, uh, and see what everybody else was, was doing. <laughs> but I thought it through, and I actually decided to pick something that I've been seeing a lot of, rather than it necessarily being one of those huge pitfalls that we see in cases, although we do see them and I'm seeing it more. So I decided to select the topic of quality of IEPs. Um, anybody here remember the days when we used to write IEPs out in longhand? <laughs> you remember that? And, you know, just between us chickens, I do believe that as an attorney representing schools for 28 years, IEPs were better back then in terms of quality. I'm really focusing on quality rather, or content and quality rather than process because there are a lot of procedural issues and those usually come to mind first as pitfalls because those are the kinds of things that happen in the, de the process of development like predetermination of placement. But I decided to really talk about and focus on quality issues because I am concerned more and more as I get hearing requests and we then obtain copies of the records and start looking through them that what I'm seeing are pretty significant flaws in the quality piece. I think we've lost vi the vision as we've moved into computerized IEP software type programs or web-based programs, whatever it might be, uh, in terms of teachers and maybe they're feeling stressed out and don't have the time, and I understand all of those kinds of things, but not looking at children when they're developing those IEPs as individuals and maybe kind of cookie cutter uh, a lot of things. And of course, my first tip of avoidance would be training on that issue in terms of really putting together in a system, a good <coughs> system of ensuring quality and having some internal monitoring of that quality. I have many clients that do self-assessments where they don't wait for the State Department to come in and do monitoring and pull those IEPs. They do them, do it themselves so that, and they don't tell the teachers ahead of time that they're going to be doing this to look at kind of quality control. And I do see a lot of cases challenging in terms of quality. I think the focus usually, if the focus is on content, IEP content, Typically, we see challenges to present levels in terms of there not being any way of ensuring that you can track a student's progress on that IEP. And of course, for us school attorney types, and certainly parent attorneys too, we're very interested in being able to demonstrate progress. And if we don't have a baseline or a starting point for that in present levels and teachers aren't trained to do that, then I, I think the present levels form the heart of the quality of that IEP in terms of what that teacher is focusing on for that year. And basically the, the baseline for then articulating what the measurable annual goals are going to be. But uh, even assuming good present levels, sometimes then I move on to the goals and interview teachers and say, so tell me how you're measuring progress on this goal, and they really can't tell me that, which to me then makes it not measurable. If they can't demonstrate through data or otherwise, of course, we're all about data these days, and so I'm, I'm wanting to see data and charts and that kind of thing. You know, you were talking about RTI, and RTI certainly a big component is the progress, continuous progress monitoring. 
And the assumption then would be if a child is going to be found in need of specially designed instruction and an IEP, then that's continuous progress monitoring is going to continue. But I don't necessarily see, I've seen in some of my districts, the clients that I work with, RTI's continuous progress monitoring has outdone what special education teachers do in terms of monitoring the progress on those goals. But the goals need to be articulated in a way that ultimately if challenged, the school attorney can defend that the child is receiving that level of meaningful educational benefit. So measurability is important also too, if indeed through the continuous progress monitoring of that measurable goal, we find the child's not making the gains that we would expect, then we should call on the IEP to come back in and look again to the quality of that IEP and revise it if it's not appropriate. Time out. Time's up. All right. Any reaction from the panel to what Julia said? Uh, I do. I, I wholeheartedly agree with Julie. I think that while all of the web-based and software management systems, they, they can create a good IEP product, but you've got to know how to, how to work it well. And I don't know if sufficient training gets to sufficient people. Um, and that ties into the progress monitoring as well, because in a computerized system, the teacher may have to actually mark for progress on those goals and objectives every six weeks or nine weeks, but have to enter a system. So they have to deal with the technology, and at times I think that becomes a barrier. What I tend to look for is, well, I want to see those IEP progress report cards, but I want to see them tie in also to teacher data keeping on those goals and objectives on a grading period by grading period basis. Another reason why I think that doesn't happen well enough is that at times we don't want to face the fact that in the middle of the school year the child appears not to be moving on this particular goal. So we might have to go back to an IEP team meeting, we might have to address that, and at times that can be awkward. Yes. I have a Clean. comment. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with what Jose and um, Julie said as well. Part of the practice that I have is always looking at those present levels of performance. I know you don't call them that anymore. You're supposed to call them something else, but I still call them present levels of performance. Plops. 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 I know. Plops I like plop plops. better. Um, and, and looking at the progress monitoring. Um, I don't want to go back to the days of longhand and carbonless paper, because um, I remember those days as well. Um, but I do agree with Jose that I think that there is a way to utilize those computer systems. Oftentimes, though when I sit in IEP meetings and the and it's projected up on a screen I'm told things like oh the the system won't let us the program won't let us do that we can't write that in because there's no there's no box um, or there's no drop down menu for that which is incredibly frustrating and I think takes out the um, individualized um, the eye out of the individualized um, but I, I do agree that the quality of IEPs and looking at how kids make progress and how you measure that. What's scary for me is when people can't tell me what they're doing to, to measure it. And when I start asking, when the lawyer has to start asking about what's baseline and people look at you at the table like, what are you, what are you talking about? So. Okay. I, I tend to answer when, we, when the, I get the, we, we can't place that into the program because there's no drop down right. menu. I said, don't we have a piece of paper? Yeah, we do. do we have a staple? Yeah. <laughs> then it can be placed into the item, okay? <laughs> if we have those rudimentary things. Amy. I think this ties back to transparency and I think it is critical to parent participation. If parents don't know where we've started on this journey, they never can come with educators on that journey and help to assess, review, revision, uh, annual uh, IEP uh, development. Ken. Kathy? And I would just like to remind all of you, when you create those wonderful progress reports, please do not destroy them at the end of the year. <laughs> uh, my, and some of my clients will do that, and I say, that's your best documentation that the child actually made progress, but they feel like they should get rid of it at the end of the year, which you cannot do. Okay. Ready, Dave? Yeah. Okay, your five minutes starts now. My wife and I have three kids, and our oldest turned 26 about two weeks ago. And we were both remembering back to the day he was born. Um, he was a failed forceps. He's got a fat head. He became an engineer, so that all worked out the way you'd expect. 
And so at the end of a very long night of labor, um, it's time for a C-section. And I remember my wife is very tired. Um, she's got an epidural, so she's singing, which was kind of fun. <laughs> and the doctor comes in with a big sheaf of papers on a clipboard. And he begins to read to her the informed consent that's required for the operation. And I remember my, my concern and amusement, it was kind of mixed, because I knew that at some point when a contraction hit, she was going to grab this clipboard and place it such that the doctor would require an additional surgeon to have it removed. <laughs> and I, I've asked her afterwards several times, do you remember any of that informed consent discussion? And of course her answer is, well, no, but we signed the form, the lawyers must be happy. And that's kind of where I want to direct my thoughts. Um, it's been interesting, sometimes just for, for grins, I'll sit back and kind of think about the relationship schools have with parents. And as I've tried to understand that relationship, one of the things I've done is I've looked at medical malpractice studies and looked at how doctors and patients interact and why doctors get sued. And it's been interesting looking at those medical malpractice studies to see how often doctors are sued, not just because they make a mistake, but when there's a mistake together with lack of trust or lack of information shared between the two. And I think that's a place where, in the education world, we can improve our desk side manner. That we need to understand that parent rights to be valuable have to come with parents who are informed as to the natural consequences of their choices. You know, we throw parents into kind of an interesting mess, if you will. Um, the law assumes, says the U.S. Department of Education, that parents always act in the best interest of their kids. And I think, by and large, that's true. But my point is, how can you exercise rights with respect to FAPE if you don't truly understand what FAPE is, you don't truly understand, as has been discussed, where your child is now, and you don't understand what the law requires in terms of benefit? You know, we throw around in the education world a lot of terms that we understand, or we think we do, but I wonder about the parents that don't get to attend these kinds of sessions. What are we doing to help them understand? Or are we talking using terms that they don't get and as a result, further ostracizing the school and, and the parent, further dividing the two. You know, with respect to the two ladies on the end, I think they would have less business if schools did a better job of helping parents understand. Because you know, it's a funny thing. Nobody wants to go talk to a lawyer. You guys don't want to talk to lawyers. Parents are no different. But they go because they think they're missing something. They go because they know there's things they don't understand. So, while you know, we have a lot of very technical rules with respect to notice, with respect to consent, what I hope you do is you don't over rely on the, the boilerplate language that you know, we come up with for those forms. And instead you use those forms as a prop through which to have conversations about what's going to happen. Conversations about here's the, the natural consequences of where we're going. The school understands the notion of educational trajectory that if we make these decisions, this is the course we're on. Sometimes parents don't get it. They don't know if I want to get here, this trajectory isn't going to make it. And if we help them understand both where we are, the trajectory, and where they want to be, then I think we get to a better place altogether because we're all seeing the same things and we all understand the same things. So don't over rely. <laughs> okay. Brevity, he had a minute left. Oh. Any reaction from the panel? Just a quick comment for me, and, and this just really comes from me um, spending probably half of my practice in the, in the healthcare realm, and so the, the comment that Dave just made is, is, a, is a very important one, and one that I, I, I think you really should pause for a moment and, and consider because, you know, for example, in Wisconsin, um, we've had that issue with doctors who have made mistakes, um, and they are quick to not communicate with the parents or the patient in that case. They're very quick to try to find another way to explain what they've done. And in the years that I've practiced and litigated those cases, the ones that get avoided are where the physicians willing to take that risk have said, you know what, this didn't go the way this was planned. I want to communicate that with you and figure out how we can go forward together on this. And actually, they avoid litigation in a lot of those cases. So I've actually found that in as an interesting analogy within the special education realm because in reality, I do have clients, school districts, that come and seek guidance from me, and my simple response is, you didn't quite get that right. 
and we need to figure out how to remedy it. And I'd rather sit down and have the, a conversation with the parents or with parents' council and say, this didn't happen right, let's figure out how to do it. And, and quite frankly, in most of those cases, we avoid a lot of unnecessary wrangling between the lawyers in, in a litigation context. So I think those are great. It's a, it's a, it's a really good point, Dave. Kathy. One comment I would make is with regard to this informed consent is that we rely a lot as school districts on giving procedural safeguards. And I don't know how long yours is now. In Virginia, I think we're 30 yeah. some pages it's long, they're, they're single spaced and little tiny print. And at 36 years ago when I started doing this, we had a single page of like 10 sentences giving parents their rights. You have a right to an independent evaluation. You have a right to access to records. You have a right to request a due process hearing. I mean, it was 10 statements, and I swear parents knew their rights better when they had 10 declarative sentences than they do now with the 30-some page procedural safeguards. Uh, we all have to have procedural safeguards of that length because of the U.S. Department of Education insists that you basically regurgitate the federal regulations. And I just say I think that's a disservice. Do, do some training on what the rights actually are so that parents really know what their rights are. I think knowledge is a, and communication is a good way to avoid disputes. Any other reactions? Okay, Tom, I think you're up. Okay, great. We have five minutes starting now. All right, fantastic. Um, like Julie, when I started thinking about this, um, what, I, what I started uh, considering was really the, the, the themes that I continue to see over the years in the practice were you know, questions that come up time and time again. And so I wanted to, to throw a, a, a one of those out there. I had amusingly thought if I got to go early, I would have raised the issue of compliance with IDEA and then seen what the rest of the group did. <laughs> um, you would have been harmed. <laughs> I, I'm confident of that. I'm confident of that. We didn't like you um, one of the issues that um, continues to resurface, and it's not, a, it's not something I would consider to be a new issue. It's an issue that's, that has been uh, prevalent in special education law and lots of case law for years and years, um, and it's the issue around placement and location. I get this question a lot. Um, and in Wisconsin, for example, I mean, there is not 100% reimbursement. So, you know, their schools have to be very um, mindful of, about exactly how they design their special education programs. They want to ensure that FAPE is available, but at the same time, sometimes that requires them to consolidate programs in different locations, physical locations within the school district. And the issue that I find comes up over and over again ends up being a dispute that arises in the context of a decision around what's the appropriate placement for a child. And quite frankly, the, the dispute is one that's not what the program should be. Okay, that one where we see the IEP team and the placement team coming together saying, yes, this is the appropriate program for the child, but then the dispute that comes up is what's the physical location of that. And for the school districts um, in Wisconsin where that issue has come up and um, oftentimes uh, the IEP or replacement team gets into that very discussion. They start having you know, a, a, a discussion and there's a disagreement around it and it ends up pushing forward into a, whether it's a due process or, or, or a you know, IDA complaint or otherwise. The law, in, and from my perspective anyway, and I've had a number of these cases, the law is pretty clear that when you're talking about a placement decision, it's a decision around what the program is that's appropriate for the child, not the physical location. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting at all that you not have a discussion and involve parents in, in that discussion around what is the appropriate location. You still have least restrictive environment requirements that you have to comply with. But again, for those schools that have you know, made a decision around where they're going to place a program, you, you need to understand that going into the meeting. I actually think it's, and I've seen this, where uh, parents have felt almost misled down the path of believing that that full component, they, that that's part of the placement decision in the sense that you know, they can challenge the, the placement decision that, or the location, rather, that the district has um, uh, decided upon. So that was the, the one um, issue that is a recurring theme that I wanted to make sure um, that I pointed out. Am I You've got uh, a little over a minute left. I'll, I'll very quickly, I'll throw, do I get to throw one more in there? Sure. Okay. 
I hope I don't mess yeah. you up. Of course, Celine. Celine. You missed Kathy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll know real quick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it is a, a, the simple issue of, of um, districts that are um, slow to pull in and engage mediation services wow. when they are having a dispute. You should not be afraid to pull in mediation services um, to help resolve issues. These are relationships with families that go on and on. They're, it's not like a physician, a patient relationship where they never meet again when something goes wrong. Look to mediation as a good way to resolve disputes. Okay, thank you. Any responses? Kathy's really, I was gonna talk yeah, about mediation <laughs> and alternative dispute resolution, but I'll still talk about that in great okay. detail. All right, any response to Tom's I'll comments? All right, Kathy, your five minutes are going to begin now. Okay, I, I thought about talking maybe about mental health issues and uh, hospitalizations and the like, but when I do my program on medical issues, I'll address that there. So that's a little plug for that program for later. But I, I wanted to talk about what I see as a major problem for school districts and that involves our ability to sell our own expertise, our inability to sell, our own knowledge of programs. I frequently, when clients give me a draft of an IEP, I will sit there and say, okay, it looks really good on paper now. Give me the top five reasons why, if I'm the parent, I should place my child in that program. Now go, you ought to be able to rattle off. One, two, three, four, five, why this is the best program or you know the appropriate program for this child and what I find is that even though each of you are experts you are licensed and trained in your field which makes you experts there's a difficulty with communicating your confidence in your own expertise there's a difficulty with telling the parents what the program is I hear things like well it's a very structured program and we have a really low student to teacher ratio. And I go, yeah, yeah, that's what you could say for just about every single special education program. Tell me for this specific child, why is this program so good? And sell it to the parents. And so the inability to communicate with confidence that you know what this child needs, which you get that type of confidence from working with the child daily, evaluating the child, you get confidence to talk about what the child's needs are and then talking to the parents about why they really need to work with you in going along with this program. Um, you know, I just don't see that out there. After all these years, I just don't see the confidence and the communication. Everyone is too afraid to speak up. Which brings me to the second part, which is go to mediation go to alternative dispute resolution or even just have an informal meeting with the administration, the teacher, and the parents. Don't be afraid to ask questions like, what is it, parents, that you would like? What is it that you don't like? What can we do to satisfy you? Sometimes the answer may be nothing, but at least have the discussion because I think so much of litigation does arise from the fact that we don't communicate well. We need to have two things that, I have one of the two, but not the other. One thing we have to have is communication skills. I think I have that. The other one is patience. And I think we, and you need the patience because communication is two ways. You need to listen. You cannot solve problems through the mediation process without listening to what it is that the parents want. And there is no downside to going to mediation. You go, you listen, you find out what the concerns are. You can agree to do something about it or you can say, We've, we're perfectly comfortable with what we've done. We're not going to do anything. But you have no loss but a little bit of time to go to mediation and try to work things out. So I guess my, my theme generally is have confidence in yourselves as experts in the school district. Be able to communicate the wonderful things about the program for that individual child. And if you can't work things out, then don't be afraid to go to some form of alternative dispute resolution. All right, thank you, Kathy. Dave, you want to react? Yeah, just to, to the first part in particular. Um, I, I think it's important for folks to recognize that education is different than it used to be. It's now kind of a commodity. 
and people see themselves sometimes as consumers. And parents in particular, for some reason, have the, the mistaken notion that if you have to go outside the school to pay for something, it immediately is of more value than the free service provided at school. And that's one of the reasons I think that Kathy's point is, is so important. We don't do, it's almost as if we're, we're very humble and we don't want to brag on ourselves. And frankly, you have lots of reasons to brag. Um, you, you serve a lot of kids, you've seen a lot of success, you're very well qualified to do what you do. Share that. Let parents know what it is they have available in front of them. Because the folks outside are certainly not reluctant to tell their credentials. And this, the parents are very much consumers. And so we need to recognize that the services you're providing are kind of seen like a commodity and there are choices to be made. So if you don't share the kinds of things that Kathy suggested and the outside folks do, well, it's only natural they're going to see those as more valuable because you're not telling all, all the benefits of what you can provide. Jose, you want to react? I have a thought in, in addition to, to the mediation process, I think there's a lot of promise in IEP facilitation. And, and instead of bringing in a mediator whose job is to really not necessarily find out a tremendous amount about the case, but just really work on a deal that can be reached between the parties in, in the span of a few hours, um, which at times resolves por portions of the dispute but leaves others open, where IEP facilitation is really the hiring of a consultant who is going to come in and is going to look at a lot of documents, is going to look at evaluations, is going to look at the IEPs, is going to interview staff, and is going to participate in the IEP process kind of as another member of the IEP team that's there kind of as an overseer, as a person who can give a, a fresh perspective to both parties, but who perhaps will indicate, well, I do think this is appropriate, I do think we should move in this direction, and, and may have opinions uh, about what may need to take place in a particular case. I think that holds a lot of promise. Now, of course, I think there's some investment on the part of the school district because with mediation, likely it's sponsored by the state whereas IEP facilitation is going to involve the hiring of a consultant unless the state has a program to provide IEP facilitators. I think there's nevertheless a great deal of potential benefit in that. Other reactions? Selene, is there anything left to talk about? Yes, there is. I okay. want to thank everybody for giving me my session a plug, staying student focused when disagreements arise. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Um, actually, five minutes has started. Okay. All right. Um, I was sitting here with bated breath that nobody was going to raise it. I wanted to talk about functional behavior assessments and behavior intervention plans um, because I see that a lot in my practice and the relationship to least restrictive environment and keeping children with challenging behaviors in their neighborhood um, schools or in general education classes to the extent extent um, that, um, that it is appropriate for them with supplementary aids and services. Um, I'll say at the outset that yes, at times there are some students who cannot maintain a general education placement because of behavior, but really and honestly, in all the years that I've been doing this, I can think of a maybe of about five kids out of all of the families that I've represented who are truly, truly unable to maintain an educational, a general educational placement. And this is also, you know, pre-Columbine and pre the school shootings. So we're talking about um, the other class of children who exhibit challenging behaviors. And I remember when my kids were in kindergarten, I used to go and volunteer. Boy, I would be so happy after the two and a half hours. So I could never be a teacher because taking care of other people's kids is a Herculean task. So I'll say that at the outset. So I do understand that when kids are engaging in challenging behavior, not staying in their seats, calling out, moving around the room, um, taking other people's things, um, pushing people away. I understand that that is a, a, a difficult situation. However, what I see is a lot of anecdotal information and very little data-driven data collection. And so when I go to IEP meetings on behalf of families, I ask those questions. Do you have any antecedent behavior and consequences? consequence um, data, any ABC data? Do you have um, any minute data? Do you know when this um, 
uh, behavior is occurring? Does it happen in the morning? Is it happening at transitions? You know, when does that happen? And a lot of times, unfortunately, teachers say, oh, it happens all the time. <laughs> All the time at circle time, he can't he can't stay seated. Well, um, does he have any occupational therapy needs? Does he have a sensory diet? Has he have been evaluated? So really looking at um, collecting appropriate data, um, looking at what are those three behaviors. I like to look at three or four behaviors. There's like the low level behaviors that we can all ignore, um, like putting your head on the desk. You know, putting your head on the desk and not engaging in conversation or engaging in the lesson plan. So you can sort of ignore some of that if it's not having a general impact on the access to education. So let's look at those behaviors that are really impacting. It's, you know, jumping out of the seat and running out of the room. Okay, that would be one behavior. It might be shoving anybody who comes near, near him. So it would be not aggressive behavior but the, the physical act, what is that objective behavior? And measuring when that occurs, the intensity of when it occurs, who's around when that's happening. And then I also like to look at what is the quality of instruction? So if you have a child with an intellectual disability who is trying to access general education curriculum in a first or second grade classroom, what does the quality of instruction look like? And sometimes administrators in buildings get a little defensive when I start asking those questions. I don't mean it to be um, an accusation, but I kind of want to look at what are those modifications and accommodations? What is the presentation of the curriculum for the student? Um, and then does that have an impact on their behavior? Um, because to me, I think it's all intertwined with maintaining um, access to general education curriculum, classrooms, and your neighborhood school. Um, and then going on to uh, an appropriate behavior intervention plan that deals with a real hypothesis for the behavior, um, not just power, not just escape, um, but really looking at ways to um, change the environment around a child, because I believe that all behavior um, is not necessarily student-centered, but has to do with the adults and how they react to the behavior. And we all can think of instances like that. I am not talking about children who may be a true danger, not a disruption, but a true danger to people. But the, the classic kids who um, get pushed out because of behavior that's not being adequately addressed. And I think that goes to teacher preparation, um, which I think is a huge issue, um, and how we teach, um, how institutions of higher education are turning out teachers um, to teach in classrooms where we have diverse learners, not just English, English language learners, not just children who need specialized instruction, not just children who have Section 504 needs, but all the kids that, that come into um, our public schools uh, these days. Okay, time's up. Okay, perfect. Any reactions from the panel? Thank you. Yeah, just something real quick. I, I've noticed just kind of observing how schools approach kids, that when it comes to kids with academic difficulties, you know, the, the classic student with a learning disability, we tend to be real sympathetic. We kind of bend over backwards. We, we know the kinds of things to do. But I notice that we don't approach the student with behavioral disorders in, in the same way. And I think it's because, you know, when the kid just lit your desk on fire, there's, there, there's going to be less sympathy. Now, I say that because it's funny, and I also say it because um, the law doesn't treat those kids differently. They're both entitled to FAPE. They're both entitled to the supports necessary to allow them meaningful benefit in the least restrictive environment. It's just that it's easier for us to do it for the kids that we're sympathetic with. And may I suggest that that's really not a place where emotion ought to play a part, that both sets of kids are, have that same entitlement. Any other reactions? Amy. It also happens when kids fart in class. I mean, they don't have to light a teacher's desk on fire. But I think the distinction is that, <laughs> that we know what to do in academic interventions, and we're just learning about what to do on behavioral interventions. and and. You know, doing a lot of work on kids diverted into the juvenile court system from schools, I'm proud to be a part of a practice in education that is leaps and bounds ahead of our criminal justice system in terms of understanding human behavior, understanding culpability, and uh, 
but that being said, we are really, I think in our infancy, we are always bringing in outside expertise because we just haven't grown it on the inside, not in Minnesota where I practice, uh, to be able to reliably tap the people that can help us understand behavior and how to intervene and how to change behavior. And we emptied out our institutions in the 50s because we've known that long how to change human behavior. I think that actually the legal system is also in its infancy is in learning how to address behavior within the context of the legal framework of IDEA. A, Celine was talking about good ideas with respect to function, functional behavioral assessments, but to be frank, they're all best practice ideas. None of it is in the legal framework. IDEA doesn't even define what a functional behavioral assessment is, much less talk about the components that it should include. Behavior intervention plans are not defined in IDEA beyond vague ideas there, there should be some form of a functional behavioral assessment and that the behavior supports and intervention should be of a positive nature. And, and that's all we get in terms of, of the legal framework. Thus, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not at all surprising to me that we at times have weaknesses in our application of the functional behavioral assessment to behavior intervention plan process. Um, there's not enough guideline in the law to give us some fundamentals that we can adhere to that are in consensus and thus practices vary tremendously from state to state, from district to district and that I think contributes to the problem. Mm -hmm. Kathy, go ahead. Just real quickly, uh, data collection has been mentioned multiple times in connection with RTI and otherwise. but. In connection with functional behavior assessment and a behavior intervention plan, I would just caution you that just because you have data doesn't mean you have anything. It has to be meaningful data. It's amazing to me how many times my clients will come to me and say, oh, I've got a stack of information like this. And I will look at it just by way of example, maybe they, they did check marks. And they said, we do a check mark on every 15 minutes. And I say, well, what does the check mark mean? And the check mark means that the child exhibited that particular behavior during that 15 minute interval. And you ask questions like, how many times? Well, we put one check mark, whether they've exhibited the behavior one time or 100 times. And I said, well, then how do you track progress? Because if they go from 100 times down to one time, you still have the one check mark. So you're not tracking anything. It isn't meaningful. So make sure you collect data in a meaningful way that you can explain exactly what it means and it's consistent across um, all settings. And finally, there's no point collecting data if you don't analyze it. <laughs> Be sure you analyze the data you collect. Any other reactions from the panel? I'll just say, if I had life to do over again, I would be a board certified behavioral analyst. <laughs> because we, can't, we cannot find enough of those folks. And I actually have clients who have children who are guiding their children in that direction because mm -hmm. there's, and if we find them, we're paying whatever it is they charge because we need them so badly. And how clever of me to insert these sound effects to try and distract the panel <laughs> and make it even more challenging. Keep going, Lenore. You're, you're diabolical. <laughs> okay, we're gonna switch gears here a little bit. We've got about a half an hour left, maybe a little less. Um, you've heard from each of them regarding some of the prominent issues. Uh, what we're going to do next is I get to identify uh, a, a, just a brief scenario and some kind of real life phrase that has been uh, shared with me, said in front of me, has come to my attention in some way or fashion through the field, and I'm going to uh, sort of lob it over to the panel, and they're going to be able to respond to real life situations. Again, if you want to chime in here, make sure that you uh, raise your hand and some WDE person will come and, and collect your suggestions. So. Uh, Hang on here, we're going to uh, start, I'm not gonna tell who has to answer, anybody gets to pick. So the first scenario here is that we have a, a student with a disability. The student with a disability reports to her classroom teacher that she is being bullied in the restroom. She reports to her teacher that a group of kids have been threatening her 
and that it's happened on more than one occasion. So when a child with a disability reports to a teacher that I'm being threatened by a group of kids, what's your response? Anyone? Amy. Uh, my first response would be consult the district's discipline policy, um, consult the district's bullying and harassment policy, be familiar with what the duties of the school district are. Uh, the office, the Department of Education has been very clear that, that uh, kids with disabilities are known to be more vulnerable to bullying and harassment. Um, they are often um, very vulnerable to it. They're often significantly harmed by it, just like other kids, but sometimes they are more often the target of it. Um, we have had a 10-year run, maybe, of convincing every hearing officer in Minnesota before whom I've had a case that a denial of a FAPE, a free appropriate public education, um, it can exist depending upon how pervasive and harmful peer-to-peer um, -peer bullying and harassment that's not corrected is. Um, and so these become issues in due process hearings. Um, and they become issues in due process hearings as a denial of FAPE claim? That's right. Okay. Anyone else want to chime in, Dave? Yeah, I think the big thing here is um, teacher needs to report it. I mean, there, there's some fascinating cases where teachers or other staff haven't reported. My favorite, because it's just so dumb, um, it involves a counselor who um, gets a report from a student. He's um, multiply disabled. He's been bullied by a group of student athletes. And because of the nature of his disability and his difficulty with language, he doesn't fill out the form that the district uses to trigger the, the, the complaint. Um, in the district, the policy is when the complaint's filed, we follow up, and they're very consistent about it. So he's reluctant to do it because of disability. Counselor hears of this problem. Rather than report it, she deals with him and tries to provide him some funny quips that he can use, kind of rip, you know, funny repartee to try with the student athletes. Of course, he lacks the requisite comic timing to make that work. <laughs> so in essence, things do not only don't get better, but there's never a report. Um, obviously, that's a failure. Um, likewise, an another piece of this that we have to discuss, when a report is made, it needs to be made to someone who cares. There's a case called TK. It's, it's a, a, from the, um, the East Coast involving a principal that at least on two occasions, um, once in an IEP team meeting, tells the parents, we, this isn't the place to discuss a harassment claim, which struck me as kind of odd, because that seems like the perfect place. And another situation where that same principal kicked the parents and the student out of his office, said, you know, we're not going to discuss this and I'm going to call security. Um, for harassment policies to work, you have to have a big picture response in place. Folks need to know what it is, need to know how to report. The folks reported to need to care. They need to follow up timely, impartial. There needs to be action taken. If any of those things are missing, you're not going to change your environment. Julie. Just because this is such a huge topic, I just want to say something about it, because I probably would say it's the number one issue. First came to mind as the pitfall issue, because I, but I figured someone else would have that before me. But um, talking about the IEP team, the place to address this, OSEP issued a letter last August to say that in most cases they would expect that a student's IEP team might be involved, particularly if there's some suspicion that the bullying is causing the child to, you know, be unable to access their education and meaningful educational benefit. Plus to determine whether or not the child might need counseling services, et cetera. And not just restricted to disability harassment cases, but all cases of bullying. And it was the USDOE's OSEP side that decided they needed to comment on this because the Office for Civil Rights had said a lot in the context of disability harassment in terms of disability basically the bullying being related to disability, but they wanted to chime in and say, but you also, teacher, if you hear reports, might need to be concerned about how is it impacting on the child's ability to receive meaningful educational benefit and remedy that through an IEP meeting. Just, just one more point. OCR's position is you have to stop it, prevent it from recurring, and remedy harmful effects. And if it's a student with a disability, where are you going to remedy harmful effects? 
where are you going to provide services? You're going to do it through an IEP team or a 504 committee. In the, there's a 2013 guidance letter where there's actually a warning about doing those kind of remediation efforts through regular ed for kids for whom placement decisions are made by teams. Mm -hmm. And I'll discuss that in my session on, on OCR. <laughs> yeah. Tom, you want to say something? <clears throat> Just one basic element of that, of all of this, that I think is implied in every comment that you've heard, and that is, you know, t obviously taking action here and, and starting with the policies. I mean, I would start right where Amy did, which is I'd want to know what the policies are. But for goodness sakes, document what you do. I mean, how are we going to be able to show that you, as a school, were not indifferent should that bullying actually be shown to have occurred if you simply have a very off-the-cuff approach um, and, and someone like me or Dave or Jose or any of us up here don't have documentation to be able to show that you investigated what happened and, you know, if the actions were taken that, that you actually took them. Because this is, this is an issue that isn't just an IDEA issue. It is an IDEA issue, no doubt. But it's much broader than that. This is a, a basic civil rights potential exposure for schools. Yeah. I, oh, oh, sorry, Kathy, oh, then Jose. Okay. I one. Uh, Following up on that, yes, definitely a, a thorough investigation is important. Depending on the nature of the allegations, it has to be more thorough or less thorough, depending on how substantial it is. If they say something occurred to me and they never identify what, then you might need less investigation than a very detailed one on this date at this time in this place, so-and-so did this to me and said whatever. Yeah, my clients, it just seems like, cannot do a complete and thorough investigation. So, and you need to document what you did to investigate who you talked to, when you talked to them, what did they say, what questions did you ask them. Learn how to do a full investigation. Finally, with regard to OCR, I think it's important to point out that while OCR says you have to remedy it and make sure it doesn't happen, that is not the legal standard. That is OCR's position. That is not the court's legal standard. They say you need to Follow up, don't be deliberately indifferent to it, but it is not our duty in the school district to guarantee that no one is ever bullied or to guarantee that if they are bullied, they will never be bullied again. That is not the standard that uh, set forth by the courts. Jose. Just a couple of points. It's, it's true that the OCR standard is different than the court standard. There's a good reason for that. In many of the bullying cases, parents are seeking actual money damages. And, and construing the bullying and the inappropriate response as a civil rights violation. The standards to achieve a jury trial and get to money damages are going to be higher. OCR is trying to set a bar that applies to bullying in general in the school. So you would expect uh, uh, differences in, in the application of the standard. A policy point is I like when, discipline, when harassment or bullying policies make the teacher have a duty to report if they know uh, about any, any allegation of harassment, whether they witness the bullying or they get a student report, and that that makes the teacher have a duty. Um, whereas if you don't frame it that way, then the teacher might tell the, the student, well, then you go ahead and you report it to the principal. It might be a little intimidating for a third grader to, to make that report him or herself. Uh, to the principal, so I'd, I'd make the teachers a much more active role in that. And as to the IEP process, uh, I think Julie's right, and it's part of the difficulty in, in really addressing a coordinated response to the bullying is that part of it is going to be campus-based responses under the local policy, but part of it is going to be the IEP team response, ascertaining what impact the bullying has had on the student, whether there needs to be a change in the instructional structure in terms of adding goals and objectives on coping skills, adding counseling services, um, adding other supplementary aids and services to deal uh, with the bullying problem before it erupts into a situation where it's damaging the student's FAPE. You don't want to necessarily let it get to that point. So there's part of the response is IEP team response or 504 committee response, and part of it is local campus response. I have one. I have one more, and then I'll I'll stop. I I was waiting for other people to talk about this, but I have represented the the bully, and what are the obligations of an IEP team to provide services to the person who is alleged to have been doing the bullying, and what implications does it have for that student's right to FAPE in the least restrictive environment, um, and what you know what are those obligations? Um, so I think that there it's. 
you know, multifaceted issue. Um, I didn't rise to, I didn't take the bait on deliberate indifference. I think we were, Amy and I were talking about that last night, and that's a whole other conversation about what courts believe is deliberately indifferent, um, indifference and um, where the liability lies. But um, in looking at, I think David mentioned TK, that's a case out of the Second Circuit, and what that court did was they took all of the bullying research that there is out there and sort of did a very nice analysis of the impacts of bullying on students. Um, and it's, you know, worth reading some of that research. I do agree that um, in Maryland we have a form. Um, and so when, you know, a bullying incident is um, reported, you have to fill out the form. The forms seem to go into a black hole. I'm not really certain where the forms are going, um, but, you know, you have to be filled out and then they go some, somewhere. Um, I think that's the, the impetus has to be on investigating it and determining whether there's any merit. Okay, hang on, Amy. I'm going to give another variation of it. I know you're jumping out of your chair at me, um, but I want to give just a slight variation, and then I'm going to present the ultimate attorney challenge and limit them to a one word response. Okay? One word. No. <laughs> Not now, you haven't heard the question yet. Okay, so we're throwing down the gauntlet here, the ultimate attorney challenge. Here's the variation on our scenario. The variation is that this, um, in, in, for this particular purpose, the special education student is the victim of the bullying. Okay, not the bully, but the victim of the bullying. The same, the special education student reports being threatened in the restroom on a couple of occasions. And in addition to that, this has been occurring over a long period of time at recess and in other settings. So we have multiple incidents of bullying the special education student. Here's, here's the, the point that I want to focus on. The principal, I'm picking on principals, I know, forgive me. The principal states, well, it's clear that we're unable to protect the student in this environment. So let's look at moving the student to another placement, all right? So now the principal is deciding, out of protection for the child, let's move the child to another placement. In the IDEA scheme of things, is that an acceptable statement from the principal? Is it doable, yes or no? No. Tom? No. Lawsuit. <laughs> it's hyphenated, so it's still one. Isn't that wonderful when you can get an unanimous opinion? All right, I'm going to switch it up here. I know I didn't get to Amy, but uh, she'll be around for questions after the panel. Uh, but I want to switch it up here a little bit because we're going to fast run out of time. We've got just 10 minutes left. This is uh, a scenario about a special education student who is removed from school for a violation of a code of conduct. Discipline situation. The student was suspended, and at the time he was told to leave school, this is a high school age student, at the time he's told to leave school, the student is told that he can't return to school until the school can be sure that he's safe, that it's a safe return, okay? And it may even involve meeting with the parents, can't return until there's some meeting that can be set up to reassure the school that the student's return would be safe. Okay, so that's the scenario. The school tells the student he can't return. What is your reaction? Anyone? Well, Got to start. I don't, I don't, I, while I think that as an approach, uh, having, having a campus administration uh, offer to have a meeting with the parents to discuss the student's behavior, I, that's, that's not abnormal. Now conditioning the student's return to the campus that he's eligible to attend and where he's receiving a FAPE on any, any parent action cannot be appropriate. I mean, my question to, to the campus that would take this step is, what if the parents refuse to meet? This now becomes an indefinite expulsion? Uh, you're gonna, are you gonna hold a manifestation determination meeting when this goes into the 10th day? And how has this been elevated to an indefinite expulsion issue? Um, are you now disciplining the parents 
for not attending the meeting, so this is beyond discipline of the student. How, how does that work entirely? I, I just don't think it's workable. And Jose, would your opinion change if they didn't use the word suspension? If they just said you can't come back? It doesn't make any well, difference. Well, it's the same thing. I mean, you, you could call it overnight I, timeout. Yeah. yeah. Happy yeah. home time. <laughs> yeah, it, we, we, cool we, off period. We, we, we had a principal who said, well, no, it wasn't a suspension. It was an overnight timeout. And I asked him, how, did, how does that work? <laughs> well, a student misbehaves during the day, and then he takes a timeout. Where? At home. And, well, does he yes. get to come back later? Yes. Well, no, the next day. Well, how is that not a partial day suspension? And he told me, no, it's an overnight timeout. <laughs> it's not called a suspension. Julie. There was a case long ago, and I don't recall the name of it, from Massachusetts, where the principal said, uh, you need to keep him home and he can't come back until he is on antipsychotic medication and a psychiatrist clears him to return safely to my school. So, and the court just said that's a change of placement that has to go through the IEP team process. I call those sort of the constructive eviction suspension, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. where you don't call it suspension, but it really is the same thing. Yeah. And, and by the way, there's a letter to Hoxter from the Department of Education that says you can't condition provision of services on a parent's willingness to medicate. Mm -hmm. Amy. So another reason that's wrong. <laughs> this scenario presents a problem of constitutional dimensions as well. There are due process problems with an indefinite suspension that is just a verbal, here's your coat, uh, see you later when some um, undefined event occurs or doesn't, uh, without notice, without an opportunity to be heard. Um, and there's a Supreme Court case called Goss versus Lopez from I think the 70s that says um, you, you, every child that's deprived of a property interest in education has a right to um, at, uh, due process, a, a process for notice and an opportunity to be heard, and with short-term varieties of exclusions under 10 days, it's at least an administrative hearing opportunity to be told what the problem is, what the evidence is against them, and to tell their side of the story. And with longer term, uh, that's the over 10-day variety. It's far more uh, extensive in terms of the rights to notice and, and hearing. And the problem, of course, with this is we don't know which it is. The very nature of it defies providing the due process that's, that is due. Anyone else? There's, uh, you probably need a response in terms of how do you, what do you do? If the student is being bullied and, or you don't think the student is safe at school, then you can call an IEP meeting and talk to the parents and discuss other options. Maybe the parent says, I don't want my child at school for a period of time either and they might agree to home-based instruction, or they may say, my, because this, you can't take care of my child's needs at school, a private placement is required. On the other hand, if it's the special ed student who is the one who is causing the unsafe environment, they're really, really aggressive, you probably still need an IEP meeting to discuss alternatives, and the parents might agree to keep the child at home. Uh, or you can always pursue an injunction if they're really, um, really aggressive. When I say keep the child at home, I'm talking about you always have to provide some education services and you'd agree on those through the IEP process. An additional complication in this area is that under some state laws, if there's a determination made by the administrative level that a certain a student has engaged in bullying, that may call for a transfer of the student to another campus. And at times it might be a special education student who's engaging in the bullying. And that raises complications. You've got a state law saying the student must go to another campus. Obviously, you have IDEA, a superior federal statute, that indicates there's, there's a process, and that's going to have to go through the IEP team process. Any moves to another placement have to be educationally based. Tom. One just quick point about it, and I'm glad you set up the scenario the way you did, Lenard, in, in that this is a principal, and again, not to pick on the principals, but I've seen this before where the special education director and staff, they understand what the process is and what needs to be required, and what they're being told by the principal is, you're not part of this, I'm making this decision uh, without you and, and moving forward because of the safety issue, and, and that's, that can create a significant liability uh, issue for the district, obviously, for the reasons we've talked about. Um, and I know several of the clients that, uh, that I've worked with, they've actually gone to the point of pulling principals in 
for just in service of just principles to understand how special education discipline works so that they don't sort of try to shut out special ed staff uh, from those decisions. So I think that we're running out of time. Just, just Last one more, comment. One more quick point. Um, in special ed, very often we'll tell the principal, no, you can't do that because of manifestation. May I suggest we also then provide the campus with the help in dealing with the behavior? Um, you can't just always say no. You've got to help solve the situation. Or principals sometimes move to these kinds of self-help remedies. So back to what Celine was talking about. Then okay. let's study it and do something different. Okay, we're going to end on an ultimate challenge here. Again, that's a one-word response. And I just want to kind of summarize it all together with uh, we have a student who is removed from school for a code of conduct. The student is uh, not necessarily told he's suspended, but he's told he cannot come back until some event happens that is conditioned upon cooperation from his parents. Attending a meeting, bringing evidence that he's safe, something that the parents must do in order for the student to be able to return um, according to the school. Is that ever an acceptable scenario? Celine? No. Jose? No. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. We're out of time. And, uh,